So how do we design an IQ test for machines, an intelligent test for machines? All right, so in the paper, I outline uh, a number of requirements uh, that you should expect of such a test. Uh, and in particular, we should start by acknowledging the priors that we expect to be required in order to perform the test. So we should be explicit about the priors, right? Uh, and if the goal is to compare machine intelligence and human intelligence, then we should assume uh, human cognitive priors, right? And uh, secondly, we should make sure that we are testing for skill acquisition ability, uh, skill acquisition efficiency in particular, and not for skill itself, meaning that every task featured in your test should be novel and should not be something that you can anticipate. So for instance, it should not be possible to uh, brute force the space of possible questions, right? Uh, to pre-generate every possible question and the answer. Um, so it should be tasks that cannot be anticipated, not just by the system itself, but by the creators of the system, right? Yeah, you know what's fascinating? I mean, one of my favorite aspects of the paper and the work you do with the ARC challenge is um, the the process of making priors explicit. Just even that act alone is a really powerful one of like, what are, it's a, it's a really powerful question to ask of us humans. What are the priors that we bring to the table? Hmm. So the, the next step is like, once you have those priors, how do you use them to, uh, solve a novel task, but like just even making the priors explicit is a really difficult and really powerful mm -hmm. step. And, and that, that's like visually beautiful and conceptually philosophically beautiful part of the work you did with, uh, uh, and I guess continue to do uh, probably with the, with the paper and the ARC challenge. Can you talk about some of the priors that we're talking about here? Yes, so a researcher has done a lot of work on what exactly uh, um, are the knowledge priors that uh, that are innate uh, to humans is uh, Elizabeth uh, Spelke from Harvard. Uh, so uh, she developed the core knowledge uh, theory, which uh, outlines four different uh, core knowledge systems. Uh, so systems of knowledge that we are basically either born with or that we are um, hardwired to acquire very early on in our development. And there's no, uh, there's no strong um, distinction between the two. Like if you are uh, um, primed to acquire a, a, a certain type of knowledge uh, in just a few weeks, you might as well just be born with it. It's just, it's just part of, uh, of who you are. And so there are, there are four different core knowledge systems. Like the first one is the notion of objectness and uh, a basic physics. Uh, like you recognize that um, something that moves uh, currently, for instance, is an object. So we intuitively, naturally, innately uh, divide the world into objects based on this notion of uh, coherence, physical coherence. And uh, in terms of elementary physics, there's the, the fact that, uh, uh, you know, objects uh, can bump uh, against uh, uh, each other and the fact that they can occlude uh, each other. So these are uh, things that we are uh, essentially born with, or at least that we are going to be acquiring extremely uh, early because we're really hardwired to acquire them. So a bunch of points, pixels that move together. Are an object. Are Absolutely. partly the same object. Yes. I mean, it, uh, I mean that, like, I don't, I don't smoke weed, but if I did, that's something I could sit like all night and just like think about. I remember when I first in your paper, just objectness. I wasn't self-aware, I guess, of how that particular prior that that's such a fascinating prior mm. that like and that's a, that's the most basic one. But objectness, actually... just identity. I uh, just yeah, objectness. Yeah. I mean, it's it's very basic, I suppose, but. It's so fundamental. It is fundamental to human cognition. Yeah. And uh, uh, the second prior that's also fundamental is agentness, which is not a real world, a real world, but so agentness. The fact that some of these objects uh, that you that you segment your environment into, some of these objects 
are agents. So what's an agent? It's uh, basically it's an object that has goals. Um, so for that instance, has what? that has goals. This this capable of person goals. So for instance, if you see two dots uh, moving in a, in a roughly synchronized fashion, you will intuitively infer that one of the dots is pursuing the other. So that one of the dots is uh, and and one of the dots is an agent, and its goal is to avoid the other dot. And one of the dots, the other dot, is also an agent, and and its goal is to catch the first dot. Velke has shown that babies, you know, as young as, as three months, identify uh, uh, agentness and goal directedness uh, in their environment. Another prior is uh, basic, uh, you know, geometry and topology, uh, like the notion of distance, the ability to uh, navigate uh, uh, in your environment, and so on. This is something that is fundamentally hardwired uh, into our brain. It's in fact backed by uh, very specific neural mechanisms, like for instance, uh, grid cells and place cells. So it's it's something that's uh, literally hard coded at the at the neural level uh, in our in our hippocampus. And the last prior uh, would be the notion of numbers. Like numbers are not actually a cultural construct. We are intuitively, innately able to do some basic counting and to compare quantities. Uh, so it doesn't mean we can do arbitrary arithmetic. Uh, uh, counting, the act of counting. That's counting, what... like counting one, two, three-ish, then maybe more than three. Uh, you can also compare quantities. If I give you uh, uh, three dots and five dots, you can tell the, the, the side with five dots has more dots. Uh, so this is actually uh, an innate uh, prior. Um, so that said, the list may not be exhaustive. Uh, so Spelke is still, uh, 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 you know, pursuing... Uh, uh, the the potential existence of new knowledge systems, for instance, uh, uh, knowledge systems that, that would deal uh, with social uh, relationships. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and there could be which is which is much much less relevant uh, uh, to something like ARC or IQ test in general. Right, so there could be stuff that's uh, like like you said, rotation or symmetry is a really yes. interesting. It's, it's very likely that there is. Uh, speaking about rotation, that there is uh, in the brain a, a hard-coded system that is capable of performing rotations. Uh, one one famous experiment uh, that people did in the uh, I don't remember uh, uh, who it was exactly, but in the in the, uh, the seventies uh, was that people found that if you asked people if you give them uh, two different shapes and one of the shapes is a rotated version of the first shape, and you ask them, is is that shape a rotated version of the first shape or not? Uh, what you see is that the time it takes people to answer is linearly proportional, right, uh, to the angle of rotation. So it's almost yeah. like you yeah. have in somewhere in your brain, like a, a turntable um, with a fixed speed. And if you want to know if two two objects uh, uh, are, are rotated version of each other, you put the object on, on the, the turntable. Turn <laughs> you, you you let it uh, yeah. move around a little bit, and then you and then you stop when you have a match. And and that that's really interesting. So what's the arc challenge? So in in the paper, I outline you know uh, all these principles that a good test of machine intelligence and human intelligence should follow. And the arc challenge is one attempt uh, to embody as many of these principles as possible. So I don't think it's it's anywhere near uh, a perfect attempt, uh, right? It, it does not actually follow every principle, but it is uh, what I was able to do given the, given the constraints. So the format of uh, ARC is very similar to classic IQ tests, in particular Raven's progressive matrices. Raven's? Uh, yeah, Raven's progressive matrices. I mean, if, if you've done IQ tests in the past, you know where that is probably, or at least you've seen it, even if you don't know what it's called. And so um, you have a set of uh, tasks, that's what they're called. And for each task, you have um, uh, training data, which is a set of input and output pairs. So I, uh, an, uh, an input or output pair is a grid of colors, basically. The grid, the size of the grids is variables. Is the size of the grid uh, is variable. And um, you're given an input and you must transform it into the proper output, 
right? And so you're shown uh, a few demonstrations of a task in the form of uh, existing input output pairs, and then you're given a new input, and you must provide, you must produce uh, the correct uh, output. And um, the uh, assumptions uh, 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 in ARC is that every task should only require uh, core knowledge priors, should not require any outside knowledge. So for instance, uh, no language, uh, no English, nothing like this. Uh, no concepts uh, taken from uh, uh, all human experience like trees, dogs, cats, and so on. So only uh, uh, tasks that are reasoning tasks that are built on top of uh, uh, core knowledge priors. And some of the tasks are um, actually explicitly trying to probe uh, specific forms of abstraction, right? Uh, part of the reason why I wanted to create Arc is I'm a big believer in, you know, when you're faced with uh, uh, a problem as murky as understanding how to autonomously generate abstraction in a machine, you have to co-evolve the solution and the problem. And so part of the reason why I designed Arct was to clarify my ideas about the nature of abstraction, right? And some of the tasks are actually designed to, to probe uh, bits of that theory. And there are things that are uh, turn out to be very easy for humans to perform, including young kids, right? But turn out to be near impossible for machines. So what have you learned from the nature of abstraction uh, from, from designing that? Like, what, what can you clarify what you mean? One of the things you wanted to try to understand was this uh, idea of abstraction. Yes. So, clarifying uh, my own ideas about abstraction by forcing myself to produce tasks that would require uh, the ability to produce that form of abstraction in order to solve them. Got it. Okay. So, and by the way, just the, I mean, people should check out, I'll probably overlay if you're watching the video part, but the, the grid input output with the different colors of, on the grid. And that's it. That's, I mean, it's a very simple world, but it's kind of beautiful. It's, it's very similar to classic IQ tests. Like it's not very original in that sense. The main difference with IQ tests is that we make the priors explicit, which is not usually the case in IQ test. So we make it explicit that everything should only be built on top of core knowledge priors. I also think it's generally uh, more, uh, more diverse. Uh, than IQ tests in general. Uh, and it's it perhaps requires a bit more manual work to produce solutions because you have to, to click around on a grid uh, for a while. Sometimes the grids can be as large as 30 by 30 cells. So how did you come up, uh, if you can reveal, uh, with the questions? Like, what's the process of the questions? Was it mostly you yes. that came up with the questions? What? Uh, how difficult is it to come up with a question? Like, is this... Um, scalable to a much larger number. If you think, you know, with IQ tests, you might not necessarily want it to, or need it to be scalable. With machines, it's possible you could argue that it needs to be scalable. So there, there are a thousand questions, uh, a, a thousand? thousand tasks in total, oh, yes. Wow. Including the test set, the prior test set. I think it's fairly difficult in the sense that a big requirement is that every task should be uh, novel uh, and unique and unpredictable, right? Yeah. Like you don't want to create your your own little world that is uh, simple enough that it would be possible for a human to reverse engineer it and write down uh, an algorithm that could generate every possible arc task and their solution. So instance, that would completely invalidate the test. So, so you're constantly coming up with new stuff. You need, yeah, you need a source of novelty, of uh, uh, unfakeable novelty. And one thing I found is that as a human, uh, you are not a very good source of uh, uh, unfakeable novelty. Yeah. And so you have to pace the creation of these tasks uh, quite a bit. There are only so many unique tasks that you can do in a given day. <laughs> so that means coming up with truly original new ideas. 
Um, did uh, psychedelics help you at all? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, but I mean, that's fascinating to think about. Like, so you would be like walking or something like that. You are you constantly thinking of something totally new? Yes. <laughs> I mean, this is hard. This is yeah. Hard. I, I I mean. I, I'm not saying I've done anywhere near a perfect job at it. Uh, there is some amount of redundancy and there are many imperfections in ARC. So that said, you should you should consider ARC as a work in progress. It is not uh, the definitive state. Uh, where, where the, the ARC tasks today are not the definitive state uh, of the test. I want to keep refining it um, in the future. I also think uh, it should be possible to open up the creation of tasks to a broad audience to do crowdsourcing. Um, that would involve several levels of filtering, obviously, but I think it's possible to apply crowdsourcing to, to develop a much bigger uh, and much more diverse ARC data set. That would also be free of potentially, you know, some of uh, my own personal biases. So right. is there always need to be a part of ARC that's uh, the test, like it's hidden? Yes, absolutely. It is imperative that, uh, the test set that you're using to actually uh, uh, benchmark algorithms is not accessible to the people developing these algorithms. Because otherwise what's gonna happen is that uh, the human engineers are just gonna solve the tasks right. themselves and, and, and encode their solution in program form. But that again, what you're seeing here is the process of intelligence happening in the mind of the human and, the, and then you're just uh, capturing it's crystallized output, but that crystallized output is not the same thing as the process that generated. The process, so it's not yeah. intelligent in itself. So what, uh, by the way, the idea of crowdsourcing it is fascinating. Uh, I think I think the creation of questions is really exciting for people. I think it, I think there's a lot of really brilliant people out there that love to create these kinds of stuff. Yeah, I, I, one thing that, uh, that kind of surprised me that I wasn't expecting is that Lots of people seem to actually enjoy Arc as a, as a kind of game. And I was really seeing it as, as a test, uh, as a benchmark uh, of uh, a fluid uh, general intelligence. And s lots of people just, uh, including kids, just started, you know, enjoying it as a game. So I think that's, that's encouraging. Yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated by it. There's a world of people who create IQ questions. Uh, I, think, I think that's a cool... Uh, it's a cool activity for machines and for humans. I and mean, people, humans are themselves fascinated by taking the questions, like, you know, measuring their own intelligence. I mean, th that's just really compelling. It's really interesting to me too. It helps. One of the cool things about ARC, you said it's kind of uh, inspired by IQ tests or whatever, follows a similar process, but because of its nature, because of the context in which it lives, it immediately forces you to think about the nature of intelligence as opposed to just a test of your own. Like it forces you to really think there's, I don't know if it's, if it's within the question, inherent in the question, or just the fact that it lives in a test that's supposed to be a test of machine intelligence. Absolutely. As you, as you solve arc tasks as a human, uh, you will uh, be forced to basically introspect yeah. how, you, how you come up with solutions. And that forces you to reflect on uh, the human problem solving process and the way your own mind uh, generates uh, uh, abstract representations of the problems uh, it's exposed to. Uh, I, I think it's due to the fact that the set of core knowledge priors uh, that ARC is built upon is so small. It's all a recombination of a very, very uh, small set um, of assumptions. Okay, so what's the future of ARC? So you, you held ARC as a challenge as part of like a Kaggle competition. Yes. Kaggle competition. And uh, what do you think? Do you think this is something that continues for five years, 10 years, like just continues growing? Yes, absolutely. So ARC itself uh, will keep evolving. So I've talked about crowdsourcing. I think that's a, that's a, a good avenue. Uh, another thing I, I'm starting is um, I'll be collaborating with folks uh, from the psychology department at NYU nice. uh, to do human testing uh, on ARC. And I think there are lots of interesting questions you can start asking, especially as you uh, start correlating um, uh, machine solutions to ARC tasks 
and uh, and uh, uh, the human characteristics of solutions. Like for instance, you can try to see if there's a, a relationship between the human perceived difficulty of a task uh, and the machine perceived. Uh, yes, and, the, and exactly some measure of machine perceived difficulty. Yeah, it's a nice play, uh, playground in which to explore this very difference. It's the same thing as we talked about with autonomous vehicles. The things that could be difficult for humans might be very different than the things that- Yes, absolutely. And uh, formalizing or making explicit that difference in difficulty will teach us something, may teach us something fundamental about intelligence. So one thing I think we did well uh, with Arc um, is that it's proving to be a very uh, actionable test in the sense that uh, machine performance on Arc started at very much zero initially. Mm -hmm. uh, while you know humans found actually the the tasks very easy, and that that alone was like a, a big red flashing light saying that something is going on and that we are missing something. And at the same time, uh, machine performance did not stay at zero for very long. Actually, within two weeks of, of the Kaggle competition, we started having uh, a non-zero number, and now the state of the art is around uh, twenty percent of the test set. Uh, solved. Um, and so ARC is actually a challenge where uh, our, our capabilities start at zero, which indicates the need for progress. But it's also not an impossible challenge. It's not accessible. You can start making progress uh, basically right away. At the same time, uh, we are still very far from having solved it. And that's actually uh, a very positive outcome of the competition is that the competition has, has proven that uh, there was no obvious shortcut to solve these tasks. Right? Yeah, so the test held up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It so, held up. That was the primary reason to do the Kaggle competition is to check if some some you know clever person was was going to hack yeah. uh, the benchmark. And that did not happen, right? Like people who are solving the tasks are essentially doing it. Uh, uh, well, in, in a way, they are, they are they're actually exploiting some flaws. Uh, of R that we will need to address in the future, especially they're essentially anticipating what sort of uh, tasks may be contained in the test set, right? Right, um, which is is kind of, yeah, that's the kind of hacking, it's, it's human hacking of the test. Yes, that, that said, you know, uh, uh, with the state of the art, that's like uh, at 20%, we're still very, very far uh, from human level, which is closer to 100%. And yes. so, and I, I do believe that you know it will it will take a while uh, until we re we reach uh, a human parity on Arc, and that by the time we have human parity, we will have AI systems that are probably pretty close to human level in terms of general fluid intelligence. Which is, I mean, it's it, they are not going to be necessarily human like. They are not necessarily. Uh, you would not necessarily recognize them as you know being an AGI, uh, but they would be capable of a degree of generalization uh, that matches the generalization uh, performed by human fluid intelligence. 